one. Hi, welcome to the show studios live at Harrods on the fourth floor. I am Leanne Elliott Young, co-founder of the Institute of Digital Fashion, an emblem for change in a broken system. So um, it's good to be here this evening. Um, we are going to be talking about the future of fashion and technology. So it's not just about one season or one show. We're talking about the wider landscape and the active change that's going on right now. So we're really lucky to have some amazing panellists with us this evening. So I'm going to hand it over to, um, to Daniel. Would you like to intro yourself? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm Daniel Felsted. Uh, I'm the uh, currently on course leader of the uh, Fashion Media Practice and Criticism course at the London College of Fashion. Katie. Hi everyone, uh, so I'm Katie Barron, I'm a writer and an author and um, I'm the head of brand engagement which covers retail and brand comms and pop culture and media at Stylus which is a trends uh, innovation and insights agency. The Iris? Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Iris, I'm a journalist and editor focused on technology. And we have Wilson. Hey, I'm Wilson. I'm an artist and a writer, and I'm also co-founder of Regenerative Futures, which is a social change initiative fix focused on bridging the intergenerational gap and encouraging collaboration and more conversation. And I'm also on the board of Leanne's Institute of Digital Fashion as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, yeah. So. We, for first of all, I just wanted to say it's such a pleasure to have you all here and it's a really, we've got a really good constellation of opinions and um, effectively the stakeholders of some of the changes that are occurring in the industry. So I'm going to do a kind of like intro specific, which is, which is I suppose an overview of some of the discussion points I'd like to jump into. Um, so first of all, how is the pandemic affecting the pivot to digital? How long has tech been with us and why is the industry, i.e. the fashion industry, why, ha why is it taken until now to listen? And how comes it's taken so long to take that move? What are the key developments you've seen in this move into digital? Um, and how strong is the sustainability message? So um, effectively, there's a lot of conversations on sustainability, but is that part of the a greenwashing narrative that sometimes the fashion industry sets into? Um, have people's habits changed? Are they, are they for the better? And one of the biggest, again, going back to sustainability, one of the biggest dichotomies in fashion is um, sustainable production and is digital some of the answers there. Um, AR and VR, is this going to imprint on our digital futures and the tactile universe? How can we, how can we not forget it? Um, and then also thinking around uh, digital avatars and the sense of self. So I was thinking, first of all, to, I mean, there's a, there's a lot there to tackle, isn't it? This <laughs> kind of big one. So. I was thinking, like, uh, Daniel, as somebody who's working um, in education, yeah. and, uh, you know, you're getting to see some of the kind of bright, um, the bright individuals that are building our future. Um, what are the key, um, what are the key kind of thoughts and um, what, 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 are the, what do they care about right now? Like what the students you're teaching, what do they care about and what kind of solutions are they making towards um, a kind of brighter fashion future yeah i mean <clears throat> i think um uh i'm trying to kind of think about this in relation to kind of technology and um i mean i guess one of the things that's quite interesting in terms of um which is a, a kind of difference between sort of certainly like my generation or whatever mm. um is in relation to kind of i guess their relationship to certain brands and their expectations about how brands operate in this um kind of contemporary environment mm. and there is a there is very much a kind of um a sense that um uh yeah an expectation that brands actually do um uh behave responsibly in a kind of just way right um and and so there's a um and then, then that obviously kind of then plays out in terms of like how that then translates into um certainly issues to do with sustainability and and the kind of questions of the kind of future where i mean i guess i guess from from my sort of generation or whatever or and or people from sort of a, a political um uh, or activist kind of position would be 
thinking of brands themselves as potentially part of the problem um, and and therefore uh, it's not necessarily about sort of getting a company to be more sustainable or to um, but, but potentially to you know ultimately maybe even to kind of uh, get rid of brands altogether or to see yeah so I think that that's certainly like one thing in terms of the shift in terms of there's definitely um, there's definitely a kind of um, probably a kind of more complex relationship to a certain degree with brands and the understanding that brands themselves are not just a kind of corporation that they're somehow separate from that um, and therefore possibly they can be um, made to do things um, again also like through kind of digital technologies and the kind of types of um, uh, I guess kind of communities or, or connections uh, or, or networks that they um, these um, uh, technologies kind of facilitate I think there is a kind of sense that maybe brands are a way that a way through which you can sort of instigate those or facilitate those kinds of um, broader social, political, um, environmental kind of changes, I guess. It's almost like the brands are these pillars and they're kind of working towards ways in which they can, it feels like infiltrate and change the, change the thinking. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think that is something quite, you know, so I think that is sort of different from uh you know i was thinking of when i was like 18 or 19 or whatever you know you you would have you would typically see like brands like nike or whoever whatever as as um um very much a kind of um part of the problem where i think now the, the kind of there is a certain shift in terms of um certain brands uh, yeah are seen as kind of possibly opportunities to do something with i mean i think that's also equally as problematic i don't think that you know i do have problems with that position um but i, I do recognize it as a, as a kind of thing can i jump in and yeah um yeah i was going to say I, I i agree with a lot of that i think you know fundamentally looking at how technology has changed what's possible and perspectives from from the by the pandemic I think you know there's been that sense of, of brands needing to become a lot more agile you know we talked about that you know needing to become more omni-channel needing to become more technologically savvy but the thing that's really interesting about the the pandemic i think is that um you know the the brands that i think have been quite successful are the ones that have, that have enabled a certain level of interactivity because the one thing that is a problematic is problematic for everybody but particularly students i think or young people is that having that sense of a kind of life interrupted that we're experiencing at the moment, that life put on pause. Um, I have a friend that runs a Gen Z Insights agency from kind of all over, um, working with schools all over the country. And he was saying that, you know, that sense of kind of having your dreams shattered and your, you know, your, your expectations. But on the flip side of that is that you can overturn some old hierarchies. You can kind of, um, some of the old traditional gatekeepers of media or brand culture, you can kind of infiltrate them, as you were saying, Daniel. So I think there is there is some interesting things happening here. And definitely, I think thinking about technology, we've certainly seen that idea of being able to imprint yourself on a brand space, whether that's even being able to comment on a show, whether it's about being able to, you know, take part of that content and do something with it yourself afterwards. Um, technology, in a way, I think, in that respect, is, is um, kind of revolutionising things. You know, these are attitudes that were there before, but they're being really accelerated because of a certain situation of, of feeling a little bit more desperate or, uh, you know, or lost at sea, in a way. And it's been super interesting to see how um, there has been lots of conversations considering how um, these kind of tr traditional pillars of, of our kind of branded reality look and how the those hierarchical systems and they're kind of how, how they sit that that there there has been this toppling and there's been kind of like how are they going to re-engage and then looking towards uh, a more kind of youth demographic to kind of rebuild that with them or for them and then even you know the projects Wilson's doing Re regenerative future is all about kind of activating that social change it's been really interesting to see like a new gaze on what the future can be and then also I suppose the potential of being able to rebuild some of the kind of um, archaic structures that were broken before. Well, it's really yeah. There's a, there's a really interesting app called um, Save Your Wardrobe, which is a, it's like a digital wardrobing app. And the thing that's really interesting in terms of um, you know Daniel, what you were saying about that idea of um, brands being part of the problem. I mean, you know, this kind of constant consumption. Obviously, that's a problem. 
But interesting, when you look at some of those things where you can see, for instance, it's an app where you can literally, anything you buy, you can take photographs of things that you've got in your wardrobe, anything mm. you buy new, the receipt will come up and it will show you what you've got in your wardrobe. But the research they've done with young people has been really interesting because young people have made comments saying things like, um, you know, um, this is helping me be the best version of myself, but also the best consumer version of myself. So there's that kind of awareness of yourself as a consumer, whether you're a consumer of media, products, fashion, stuff, whatever you want to call it. That was really interesting. So looking at those kinds of digital technologies where they can assess really quickly, you know, a brand's ethical status, the carbon footprint, all of these kinds of things that all of a sudden, you know, I mean, this is quite a practical thing. It's not quite so much on the creative side of things, but they're really interesting, those technologies that allow us to sort of join the dots that allow that allow for that attitude where people are really concerned about the the, the role that brands are playing in in you know creating problems and trying to address some of those things so at least you have a sense of control and you can kind of um, balance things up slightly. Um, so I thought it was interesting just that person talking about being the best version of themselves or the best consumer version of themselves was quite an interesting way of looking at the world because I would have never have looked at the world as like a nineteen year old myself like that. Yeah, and there's also there's that kind of the way that transparency now you can, it's it's like 360 how technology can change from the B2B to B2C. So yeah. in print, like you say, some of the kind of the eye-rollingly kind of laborious and boring points of like SKUs and items and size and et cetera, all of that can be transcribed yeah. in a second through, um, but also as well, you can, you can trace where an item has been through blockchain, et cetera. So it means that for sustainability, you can have all, now all these markers of where something has been and there's not a, as easy a kind of, press kind of moment to kind of avo avoid it you know we all know the yeah. of press and PR and how that can kind of simmer over and kind of delete uh, and, some, and some of that tech I mean I said it was quite practical but actually some of it is also really creative because the whole point of apps like that are really to be able to say look this is what you've got in your wardrobe but of course when you bring in a layer so you bring in the kind of like digital creation and like you know f like fashion products that may only exist in digital that idea of being able to you know think of yourself as a stylist think of yourself as actually I'm going to try these things out in a way and I'm going to you know I'm going to um allow myself to express myself in a way that I couldn't have done before. There's actually a really creative element to that. And then of course, you know, it's almost like these competitor communities ideas, a bit like a dress or an age or something like that, mm. where actually you can play with your persona in a way. I mean, I know we'll get onto that discussion later on, but you know, so on the one hand, you've got this thing where it's like, literally it's practical just seeing what you own and seeing what you, what may be helpful to you to own, maybe looking at your own patterns, your own being able to monitor your own behaviours, but also being able to play with your identity as well. So you've got kind of two really different sides of the spectrum being conjoined. And we'd never really have seen things like that, I, I think, um, really taking off quite as much when we had a choice. So the beauty of not having a choice is it's giving us a bigger affinity with these digital technologies um, that will make them fly. So, yeah. Okay, quiet. <laughs> Um, so thinking about the the I suppose like the the idea of self and this kind of lots of the there's a, there's a big um, over kind of hanging shadow of technology which is that it's going to take everybody's jobs and that's one of the big kind of pain points of the industry that there's you know with digital avatars that means that you know is there a need for a real model with digital clothes is there a need for um, the fashion universe that is you know that we wear on our skin so um, I wonder Iris if you want to talk about some of your work and the fact that um, how like, identity is woven into the self and this kind of idea of this digital universe that we're kind of now locked within. You know, I'd all love to kind yeah. of across the table and chat, but we're, we're kind of, we've seamlessly kind of, kind of delved into this digital reality. Yeah, um, I think the main thing that I've noticed within like the phases of how we've adapted to like new technologies is that like a few years back was like the first i guess like people first noticing how they could use uh 3d or like ai in ways that um they're like accessible because it became more accessible mm. but i think now for me what I find the most interesting in life, fashion and technology in the future of fashion is finally brands are tapping into like the, the full spectrum of like meanings and context that the internet kind of intertwines constantly. Mm -hmm. 
and by that I mean like meme culture or like any sort of viral phenomenon or even like internet um internet uh groups uh subgroups like like the concept of the emo person or like different genres um I think for a long time fashion kind of shunned it and then the moment it became you know life became essentially us living online because of uh, quarantine that's when I think a lot of designers especially like big fashion brands who had for a long time relied on like past generations who had like super traditional perceptions of like culture and how culture manifested uh, they could rely on that like um, demographic of clients but now with the internet being like the main source of everything um, those brands are kind of like scrambling to recontextualize themselves and kind of like subvert the meaning of what their brand used to represent so i.e that can be via Balenciaga or via like Blue Marine or even like people like um, Lotta Volkova who are like constantly kind of like taking all the different cultural signifiers of a brand that have built themselves through years of that brand being alive and via the internet and like internet culture kind of like even the meme memification of like brands in a way so that's like the main thing that i see um happening so been, from so it's changing so, through like all the semantics of how um brands i suppose like interact and the whole language of, yeah of, yeah of I've, that way. yeah and i think like 3d and like and like textile technologies and all of that is a big part of that but an, an even bigger part of that is how we now process like information and especially commercialized um, information so like I think brands can't afford anymore to put out content that isn't self-aware or isn't aware of like all the different meanings going on so that's why brands like Balenciaga do so well in my eyes um, because they embrace the constant layering of context by the internet and by technology. So if we talk about the kind of le the, the layering of our, uh, the kind of layering in language, and then if you think about the kind of the way that one will shop now in this kind of, I was I keep saying post COVID, but it's not, it's, we're still in it. So, um, but to what do we, it, yeah, yeah. Within, from within COVID, like what yeah. do we, yeah. How do we feel? I mean, there's obviously lots of anxiety about being in the physical world and the idea of the retail space, what that now means. And um, how do we see, I mean, um, lots of the work we're doing at um, Institute of Digital Fashion right now is weaving those realities, how they work and how you can impregnate into a, into a physical garment, digital images or, but now it seems it's vice versa. Like how can you, how can you have your digital reality and, and bring the physical into that space? It's like, it, it's kind of, a, it's, it, I feel right now there's this kind of tussle with post, are we gonna step into a post COVID reality? Like where, how does, where's technology gonna step in and intervene in that kind of? I, I, yeah. I'd say it's, um, I'd say it's a real mix. I'd say it's like the true meaning of fidgetal. People have been talking about fidgetal for a couple of years, but I think not really, Kind of abusing the term slightly i think you know fundamentally ultimately we we are going to be half the time or maybe more living in, in kind of digital environments or we're going to be living in physical environments that have a digital layer into layer on the top or interwoven within them um i mean one of the most interesting things that i've tried recently is a really interesting um vr experience um called it was with riot who are the, Ver the verizon medias and um, they like immersive content laboratory basically and it's really interesting because they're such an interesting group of people because they're a little bit like ILM lab from from Lucasfilms yeah. who kind of work between entertainment gaming retail brand culture which we, to be honest is where like a lot of fashion brands should be looking because so many fashion brands try and get into these spaces it's a bit like you know gaming is the new social which is pretty much true but they mm. just think they'll just kind of place themselves in that space rather than understanding the mechanics of those things 
But anyhow, I tried this thing and it was really amazing because I went in and you go in and you, you go in as an avatar. And it was all about kind of rethinking what the fashion experience could be. So it was going in and it was thinking this was kind of in August. So it was when thinking about maybe there won't be any physical shows in September. Mm -hmm. And you go into this space and it's so realistic. The thing that's amazing is that you have this incredibly realistic sense of being in a physical space. They're all in yeah. VR. In VR, and yet it's this like fantastical space. So it's kind of, you recognize enough of it that you feel like, okay, so I'm walking into this kind of amazing, it was with the Museum of Other Realities, mm. incredible like gallery space. But when you go in, you're able to interact with people in there. You're inter able to interact with the content in there. You're able to- the thing about VR, there. it's just been lonely for such a long place, isn't it? This kind of- Exactly, like, yeah. You put your headset on and then- Yeah, and this is the incredible thing that it had taken it to a space that was like a shared immersive experience. So when you go in there, and at this point, I think I'd spent about three days literally just sitting at one desk- In there. In the room. Oh. In there. <laughs> in there. No, no, not in there. Three days. Beforehand. So beforehand, <laughs> yeah. Well, I might well have. I mean, time. It's a bit difficult to tell what the time is, is when you're in there. Um, when you go into that weird VR wormhole. Um, yeah. But the amazing thing that, oh, when I was in there that really amazed me, it was incredible because you go in and you could you could see your shadow on the floor. There were other people in there. So you basically see people moving around towards you. So imagine like being in a VR kind of like party. Mm -hmm. um, and as people walk towards you, you could hear their voices. So you could hear it. So a lot of these kind of humanized elements that made it really compelling, enough to kind of like fake it for your brain, essentially. Mm. That kind of sense of verisimilitude was in, were in there. But the thing that was incredible is that you could go in and you could have an experience, you could kind of step inside um, a sort of what, what, you know, forget the fashion being kind of being a catwalk. It was like these designers, there were three designers, Charlie Cohen was one, there were a couple of others in there. Um, and they got to create almost like, you know, like the heyday of shows when it was all about really expressing who you are as a designer. So you could go in, you could watch films, you could kind of step into these worlds. One of them had this like, um, Dagmara had this like incredible, like pumping, like soundtracks. It was like a full on club experience to really understand what her brand is about as well as the product. But the interesting thing is that the guys that designed it said you know that moving forward they said it was absolutely possible to put an omni-channel element in there so you could go in for instance and you would be able to say talk to a sales associate or you could mm -hmm. wish list something to then be put by in a physical store so if you're kind of like become really seduced by this digital environment but actually I need to see and touch and feel the real thing which we can't do quite as well at the moment you could do all those things there was this kind of joining up of the dots between the physical world the digital world it was almost imperceptible you know I was having a really incredible kind of social experience in this digital space in this digital space and that's it I think like the historic timeline of fashion and how it's kind of you know the shows were I mean nothing had changed much at all it was still yeah. you know, a walk up and down or a massive set build and then to if you know because of the internet and the social media channels it meant that all of a sudden it wasn't coveted anymore it wasn't for just yeah. press and buyers you could you could see you could watch but it's still quite um a kind of layer was missing you had to yeah. wait months until the campaign come out and then another six months until it was installed exactly and exactly and i think what was um what was lovely about this is that, you know, there, there was a sense of kind of real um, potential digital democracy with these spaces. Mm -hmm. because it's a little bit, you know, the idea of being able to allow other people to watch shows and also to be able to critique shows is really important. Yeah. So that idea that kind of anyone could go in there and enjoy those spaces. But I think, you know, for brands that are kind of thinking, but how do I tier this experience? How do I create mm -hmm. an experience where you kind of create VIP spaces? It's a little bit like akin to what we're seeing happening with social media at the moment. You know, with social media overall, there is a way of what you call big open social networks because to a lot of people and this is quite transgenerational um, but particularly for young people that sense of actually they're, they're not meaningful spaces anymore being just on Instagram I mean it's great you know we all use Instagram because we had to but in the same way for a lot of people it, you had to be on Facebook because you just felt you needed to be but actually Facebook it's that um, it's that idea that there's a journalist called Sarah Wilson that sort of talks about it being like being like an airport you know until recently, everyone had to go through an airport, but would you really want to be there? Yeah. Um, so that idea of creating what you call kind of digital campfires, where you can kind of create smaller groups within the groups. Um, and, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that is born from 
behaviors that come out of gaming, but they're really going to start make, to make a lot more sense because the more that we feel that social media and brand culture is infused with either gaming mechanics or the games themselves, mm -hmm. the more those kind of smaller groupings and how we have these subdivisions that feel more meaningful online will become much more important. Um, that will take cues and will take the kind of meme mechanics and all these sorts of things. Um, so I was just, it was an experience that I was a bit like, oh, I, I'm quite cynical about those experiences. I had to be, um, but it was, but I was kind of amazed by it. It was really good. And I think it's that you hit the nail on the head there. It's that kind of re reissuing what it what it means to what a fashion show means and what fashion means. Like being able to step into the brand universe, have audio, visual, and it yeah. kind of so it layers it so it isn't just about the kind of hierarchical systems again of the of the front row. But then again, lots of um pushback we're having with these immersive digital experience that we're creating and it trying to introduce this kind of as you were saying this omni channel like how do you how do you purchase like what what does it mean to be in this universe is it where's the front row you know because we you know well, the landscape everyone can be involved but where is the front row you know so it's really interesting to see all these different kind of um questions and conundrums that are occurring which are how do you because i think part of it is that we don't want to mirror the broken system we want to innovate and progress beyond that but there are some points like it's just hilarious to hear like yeah but we you know democratization etc but we need the front row like how how yeah. do you still make people feel as though they're at a fashion show and like have that kind of sense of well yeah i mean um for instance for me when i see 3d uh shows that are just like a 3d like mannequin walking around and it having like a nice background with intermittent like uh, animations for me that's not really enough considering i can already get that from gaming or being on tiktok or anything but i think a really good example of someone who did the virtual experience really well was uh travis scott doing like a gig on like a concert on Fortnite, yeah. um, and so if you look at like the playback of the concert it's like visually so enticing and so interesting and it really goes above and beyond to um, take into account that you're in a virtual world where anything can exist and anyways I don't think anyone watches shows anymore really to see how the clothing fits so much and more so get more of that like authenticity of the brand and the brand ethos so i think brands should stop trying to focus on like what's showing my clothes better we need like the model walking around no one cares they can go on essence to see how the clothing looks on a model and these shows and all of these like presentations should really embrace what their brand represents and try to trickle that down mm. into like different technologies and animations. It's super interesting what you said about then and it's like then the step to go and see on Essence. So it's like how do you as you as Katie was saying, how do you weave all those together? And I think even in the retail space it's it's I think everyone's kind of uh, you know a little bit fed up of seeing the kind of similar size torsos and, and the fact that um, we're working on a couple of projects now which which basically introduce a kind of more sliding scale of e-fit something which isn't that difficult but just that yeah. brands didn't have to do or retail environments didn't have to do whereas now it's kind of um, well we're in a space where people aren't you know because of covid you know popping into stores and the thing it's more like let's order 15 at home in various sizes and try them on we all know that that's bloody awful for sustainability and also for you know you hear about them then being you know shipped back into landfill so looking at ways in the physical representation of the body can be more true to lie through tech i think that's a really interesting part of it. i think yeah i think again this is another thing where fashion is going to really um really benefit from from working with i mean there's always a lot going on in this space of personal avatars already so yeah. i think exactly as iris said you know that idea that i mean the fashion show you know if we think back to the days of particularly thinking of um you know, you know, McQueen shows arguably still being the kind of benchmark for this in a way. Um, 
you know, thinking about those shows where everything about that show is immer about immersing you in that brand of that designer's universe, about literally taking you in, into the wormhole of their imagination. Mm. And I think when you have, then when you couple that with the kind of new technologies, we've just done a big piece of work on this actually, a new virtual fit technologies that will allow you with your phone to create a really re quite realistic avatar of yourself. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, then you can take it and that can be a secondary thing. So you get to have those moments and then take those things and later on it might you know, it might be then you might be so compelled to do it then but it might be two days later it might be a week later and then you and then you try it on afterwards but that's all part of brands you know needing to recognize that where the sell comes is not necessarily in the instant that you're showing something and that's really hard for brands to get their head around brands are very much like make it purchasable in that moment and actually you know we don't really think like that we tend to put things aside we tend to you know we categorize our lives in different ways so um that's so good. those virtual avatars i mean i know again that's the kind of thing about personal identity but there's a really incredible practical aspect to those um mm. as well and then also um actually Dan me and danny were talking um around the the idea of the website and the fact that it's fallen into this category of just being a place where it's yeah. you, you purchase and that's kind of that's the, it's almost transactional. Whereas thinking of websites, you know, even you know, the birth when when we're all kind of like considering the the possibilities of website like ten years ago, fifteen years ago, if you if you think about the kind of how one would you know be, you, there's so much work went into it and they've just become in the, fallen into this like service category and I think now the more the work that we're doing and um, we're seeing that people want to kind of invest more time into that space into yeah. building the imagination building the brand universe building a kind of in gamifying the, the transactional approach so you keep it in your basket but then what happens when it's in your basket it's like thinking about all of these different and there is and there is a there is a um, like there's a complete myth that that people especially young people won't watch content um for longer than kind of like 30 seconds which just isn't true if you've got really good content whether it's film or an immersive film or something that you can interact with or get other people to have a perspective on you know shared views and things um, people will watch for quite a long time, you know, like upwards of, you know, 15, 20 minutes, which is, which is, would think we unheard brands would think that was pretty much um, unheard of. So there's actually yeah, the case for kind of creating amazing content, um, but particularly things that are kind of interactive um, is, is really strong. Well, just as just as one little quick thing to add, that idea of having like long form content is um, kind of proven by like the movements that you see in like time videos on youtube because like a few years back all, most videos were like five minutes long at best um and now any like famous youtuber tends to post like content that's like 20 40 minutes long and people watch the whole thing because the content is good mm. so um wilson and you're yeah. and in the regenerative list you know that's all about kind of listening to youth and kind of giving that space are there any like key um proposals that were kind of brought to light that really were excited you that were kind of thinking outside of the box like it was it considering this kind of because that was a kind of global call wasn't it to kind of change our future was there any from there that really just felt that were kind of like almost like radical and beyond even your vision of what the future could be in terms of fashion specifically or or just in general we could start with fashion we could traverse <laughs> um i can't say there's anything that was unexpected it's more that people were actually putting up sorry before i get into this also another reason why long form content became the norm on platforms like youtube and so on is simply because uh content creators would not get ad would not get paid if, if their content was less than 10 minutes so that was also a big change in factor in, in the increase in the length of content of course most audiences or long term watches are, are pretty much young people but it was also because these advertisers wouldn't pay for like only a popping up on a very short video for the most part uh, so it's like they pushed, they pushed into they were like, we, we need more time. Yeah, so so yeah. The, the push was that now content creators would, wouldn't really get any monetization or they wouldn't make it as much because it's uh, like see cost, it's like cost per thousand or, or cost per click. So they wouldn't really make that much unless it was like over a set amount of time. But um, in terms of interesting 
ideas or technologies. I think it's it's also been a lot of um, well, some of the things that really excited me on making use of like say for example waste. So there's like a great idea, or some uh, we had various people coming forward with ways of uh, producing uh, clothing or material garments from kombucha, or people who were using in fruit pills and using that to, to make new materials and stuff like that that could be at different textures or or um or densities and stuff like that for, for fashion use and beyond um in terms of but then there was also a lot of uh people who really wanted to kind of um because for the general marketplace at the moment there's a lot of misunderstanding and lack of information in terms of how uh or what sustainability actually is or or how how to determine if if this is bad for the environment and so on and so forth. So there was a lot of ideas around kind of disseminating those that information for the for the general audiences, whether to a specific region, and also trying to become uh, I don't say like um, like a one stop shop or being like a a great filter for all of these kind of different sustainable products. So, so that was like a key thing that we saw that a lot of people are thinking about how can they make it more easier for the consumer to understand what sustainability is, but, and, and that's something that changes every day and it's dependent on region, uh, mm. product, uh, and, and various other metrics as well. So I'd say that's one thing that really stuck out with regards to um, fashion or a few things that did. Mm. And I just um, I, was, I was just thinking about that in, um, in relation to I guess in relation to the questions about the future and um, like linking um, the climate crisis and and kind of emer well not emerging kind of emerging to currently kind of existing kind of tech um, there's um, especially kind of AI and sort of machine learning and and uh, kind of the connections to that in, in relation to automation. Um, I mean, the, the from a kind of climate crisis perspective, the the, uh, the understanding that kind of twenty thirty is this kind of I mean slightly arbitrary, but sort of like a, a gen sort of generally kind of recognised kind of point of mm. sort of um, that um, requires kind of significant kind of global systematic change in order to um, uh, reduce the um, the scale of the kind of impact of, of the climate crisis. Um, so you have this kind of 2030 point for, for the climate and, and that's sort of relatively sort of understood or sort of whatever, um, but e equally and, and kind of, but less understood and less, I think like less discussed in, in kind of generally is this um, 2030 within kind of AI research or within sort of, um, uh, within the kind of social sciences and in looking at kind of the impact of AI and automation on social life and kind of work and 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 questions of kind of collective identities um, uh, indicate that 2030 is and is and also a kind of point where uh, collectively we need to kind of get to grips and get have a kind of understanding and kind of put in kind of uh, uh, policies and practices um, to respond to this um, uh, this shift and this kind of the increasing kind of per pervasiveness, I guess, of kind of AI and automation. Like these things are happening, and so I mean the impact and kind of work is going to be um, incredible. You know, I mean, and that that could be incredibly liberating, or it could be incredibly horrific. You know, and so I think. Um, in terms of when we think about the future, I think it is this kind of, uh, for me, it's like the, the key thing is this intersection between the climate crisis and kind of issues of, certainly like issues of, uh, or kind of technologies like AI and automation is like, what kind of future will that, um, or what kind of future do we want to kind of develop? With those two, I mean, planetary forces at kind of work, um, and I think that is, we are, we are sort of, uh, it is kind of open at this point, but that the, the space is incredible, I mean, is narrowing um, day by day, um, hour by hour, you know, and I, and I think possibly just, just, just thinking about the kind of questions of um, uh, younger generations, whatever, I think part of the problem is, is that like, um, 
and it's probably like a responsibility of like people like me and whatever is that, that in a way that hasn't been these kinds of discussions haven't been framed and they haven't been um welcomed and so it's only sort of now really that we're starting to actually kind of think about that so you know if i was like 18 or 19 like it would be i think it would be very difficult for me to um to un to even start to think about what a future would be you know other than I, I don't want to die in so many years time, which is, you know, like, I think that is a sort of, um, in a sort of doom like way that is sort of um, a kind of whatever. Do you so think from birth from that is like nihilism or is it a kind of a, a push to, to change? Because I know like on, on your course specifically, it's the impact of technology, ethics and uh, the politics of fashion. Um, which uh, look at the kind of broad social, environmental and cultural awareness. So kind of mm. you're in the space where you're listening, you're, you're working towards better in that, you know, a future and trying to kind of work out how malleable, how malleable that future can be, thinking about yeah. where we are now. And it, I suppose yeah. it's like in so many ways, COVID has pushed us into really considering or stopping for a, for a start and then really considering what our future could be. But now because, like we were saying before, it's that the, the future is kind of is morphed into more than now because not, nothing much is changing. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd love to jump in there because I think it's super. I think Daniel, it's, su it's such an interesting question and, and it affects literally every part of our life. I mean, even because the job that I do, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're doing is advising brands what will work, which spaces you should jump into, where should, you should innovate. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are so many issues with this where, where you're sort of talking about things where you think, OK, look, this will undoubtedly make some money. But you also have to look at the impact of these technologies on the, on the fabric of society. It's a little bit like for, even, for instance, talking about creating communities and small communities which on one level is really positive and really powerful to get people to connect with people um you know like-minded consumers not consumers like-minded people um create these, these these groups where people feel kind of safer in one respect they feel more seen in one respect but then again even and this is just one small example of this but then you also have to think about how do you create those spaces and how do you you know people that are working with you know algorithmic bias etc all these things to make sure that actually you're not creating safer spaces that are potentially becoming very myopic and creating a sense of othering in other, in other respects. So that's just one tiny example of thinking about the way that we use technologies and the systems, you know, predominantly things like, you know, it might be work systems, it might be predominantly things like social media and the way that brands tap into them or even feed them. Um, mm -hmm. to create systems that are more positive and it's and it's complicated because there's a lot of gray areas with there I mean I met the one I mentioned to do with kind of small-scale communities being a, a really key one I think because it's, it's one thing on the one hand you know community sounds very cozy um, and there's so many positive aspects and necessary aspects of that but then also thinking about where these things can go wrong so and that's very connected to you know to, to AI technologies to the social media uh, technologies that run social media um, it's all these things it's you know as Daniel was saying I feel like um, yeah lots more discussions need to, need to be had about what do we almost save what do we value what do we save what do we ring fence in some respects it's a really huge set of questions but it's a really really important time and i think um yeah we talk we talk about ai a little bit less than we did and automation a little bit less than we did about than climate change uh, recently and and the two things go hand in hand so we have to mm -hmm. well hand in hand it's, it's, it's the double the two pronged beasts in a way I mean, I think the other thing with something like AI, I mean, I was thinking about kind of questions of sort of avatars and identities and these kinds of things is that, I mean, like for me, the the amazing sort of potential or possibilities of AI is that actually um, we don't simply use it to make our lives a little bit more convenient or, you know, allow a brand to be able to target a particular potential customer more effectively but actually it provides a certain kind of um i mean it, like it offers the possibility of a kind of a completely alien form of intelligence that that then we can use then to reflect back on ourselves and almost construct a new kind of sense of identity or a new kind of human in a lot of ways possibly you know and and so therefore like the kinds of identities that could come out of that are not just simply sort of like a, a 3D 
uh, version replica of our uh, um, whatever like uh, meat what we're like in what's referred to as like meat space but um, but actually sort of um, like it, it, it could be kind of a very different kinds of uh, different kinds of identities and different kinds of avatars and different kinds of um, forms that, of intelligence or identities or whatever yeah. that spawn that as opposed to it being used simply as a kind of means to yeah. optimize existing um, existing processes that are fundamentally incredibly problematic yeah. you know I mean well, you know like so it's almost like your subconscious isn't it like there's all of this kind of um, algorithm, all this information on us that we that we openly pour into the ether that is the internet and, and the world. It's being gathered and pulled together. It's almost like a representation of our subconscious rather than our, we're our conscious that we're projecting. So it's yeah. almost it knows us better than it knows ourselves because it knows then, the multifaceted faceted reality that is our conscious self. And yeah, self. yeah. And I, and I think the thing is, is that you start, I think you are starting to see a glimpse of that, say, for instance, with the, um, with say like machine learning um, uh, a neural net kind of images that are being kind of generated. Just, I mean, this is just a very kind of obvious or kind of, but the kinds of imagery that is kind of um, these, these um, AI systems are kind of generating. I mean, they're just so alien. They're like so unhuman, mm -hmm. but they're incredibly fascinating. Like they're amazing, you know? And it's like, I think it's almost like there's something um, for me, that's the, that's like, uh, that's a kind of gold mine, you know, there's something really amazing about that, you know, um, that opens up certain possibilities, you know, that, that, yeah. I was gonna say, if we were all gonna, uh, you know, step into, I'm trying to think of a, of a date that, that seems like the future, because 2030, I think obviously our, 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 our planet's gonna be in disarray. So, I mean, should we just say a post-apocalyptic 2030? Like what would, what would our, what would our fashion realities be? You know, is it that we're all in our meat realities um, and kind of well, so the, the internet because the world has imploded, you know, imploded, we're in climate, thick in climate crisis. There's no, there's no um, atmosphere. There's, there's probably, there's probably no internet. We have to kind of like cycle to get a kind <laughs> of internet to our avatar up so we can show our Balenciaga, you know, curated version of our AI. AR self, like what, what would be, what do we all think would be um, fashion in a dystopic, because we are being quite dystopic, but I think it's a reality, possible reality. So what would be um, fashion in this post-apocalyptic 2030 reality, how would that weave in? But just one more thing about like uh, the algorithmic bias and like the building of small communities. I, there definitely is that, especially on apps like Instagram, but I think there's a conscious movement to try and kind of like, I wouldn't say combat because obviously companies still want to have that bias so they can, you know, make these al algorithms and make money from it. But applications like TikTok are kind of moving that towards still having something centered on you and centered on your community of interest but already still trying to put new things in and present new things to you that are maybe popular, but are still somewhat outside of something that you'd see, like the content that I see on Instagram is fully me, fully built by me, for me, but the content on TikTok is maybe 70% me and then 30% stuff that I can really learn from and see something new and you can see um and you can see that mirrored in how younger newer generations are creating their own culture so be that through e-girls and e-boys and like boys being so much more playful with their sexual identity and their fashion identity like so i think it's i I think it's a bit harsh to say that we are moving into just like completely shut off self-sustaining culturally like little micro groups because I think there is kind of like hopefully I feel like a small movement trying to go against that. But still in those spaces it's interesting how it's kind of there's the anarchy in in the 
through in the in the four walls of that space as well and then how do you how do you push back against being part of the kind of uh, the knowledge of the algorithm how yeah. do you get that surprise and delight because it's obviously designed to surprise and delight you yeah yeah <laughs> I think it, exactly. I think it's just that kind of sense of self awareness. But I think that's interesting in itself because I think, and this possibly relates to, to what Daniel was saying about, you know, on the, on the one hand, you've got uh, sort of technologies that can create these quite inhuman systems, but there are. I mean, there's, there's a number of coaching apps, for instance. I mean, they're mostly in like fintech actually, but it's interesting because they show they give you an awareness of your own behaviours. So it's almost like you can self check yourself. Things that would be wow. quite. <laughs> Like with the fintech stuff, it's showing you like when you're making bad decisions, like it will say, do you realize that you have a tendency to do this? You have a tendency to not put money on something actually just before it's about to go up because you always get nervous at this point. Do you know that you do that? And I'm sure it's very possible to do similar things, whether it's kind of fashion or entertainment or anything else, just to give you these sort of self checks. Mm. to make you give you a greater awareness and that's so that's one way that it might be possible to kind of get, allow you to be in these groups and these really important groups to make you you know it's almost like the kind of squad culture thing you know there's a lot to be said for having pulling people around you and, and, and also meeting people that maybe from the other side of the world as part of your small community um but with the with the other side of it where you can maybe have like a better much better awareness of your own behaviors that would allow you to sort of change your own behaviors and i think that's something that's um thinking of the more kind of positive sides of technology mm -hmm. that's something i'm quite interested in at the moment how tech can maybe um to say make you a better person is is the wrong way to look at it but i think we have to we have to look for the positives mm -hmm. in things because we have because we are living with this stuff now you know it's not going away so we mm -hmm. might as well those spaces where we can we can learn and we can kind of but it's it's, it's about putting ourselves in those questions and having debates mm -hmm. um, so that god i sound like a politician then that's really bad <laughs> uh, there's not much debate <laughs> that's the yeah, issue politics. Politics. Um, okay. yeah, so what would be yeah so we what would be our what what will happen in 2030 what would fashion look like do we feel i'm so i'm gonna push back on the anti-tech narrative because i think uh, for a few reasons, where we will be much better than most people are, are projecting. I think there's a lot of fear, which is based on lack of information. So mm -hmm. first, I'm going to raise a few points. Um, fashion is historically anti-tech and anything that affects their profit margins. Uh, we can see, like in most industries, really, apart from like telecommunications and the internet, since even like around the 70s or 60s, there haven't really been much progression, only like slightly. You can say the same for medicine and healthcare, you can say the same for finance, really. You can say the same for a lot of stuff, which is why a lot of these systems are imploding now. So um, when we look at what is the bigger issues with regards to fashion is simply because they've been trying to safeguard how they've made profit margins, whether that's like, 13 yeah. to 20 times more than the cost of the material and, and various other things like that. Also, I want to tie in this part before I move forward. So the the kind of um, push towards AI or, or more automation isn't a relatively new thing. Since we, uh, you can go back three, 400 years ago, when even early on in fashion, one of the first technological inv inventions was the spindle machine or something like that, which was uh, which essentially immediately reduced the amount of people it took to to weave or make clothes. I think if that's a there is a machine, I'm not sure if it's called the spindle machine, but there's definitely stuff like that and has been the case with regards to whether it's the invention of the steam engine, uh, other forms of, of technological advancements. It's not just the internet that we should consider as technology. Anyway, so moving back or moving forward, um, it's not so much an issue of automation, it's more so, are we willing to embrace the upcoming technological advancement by upskilling and presenting new roles? Because say, if we go to fashion universities or even looking broadly, it's like most universities aren't teaching for jobs that are popping up now or, or will do in the, in the next five to 10 years, even like social media as, as, a, as a like, as a university course or, or any form of school and course is still in its infancy then and, and you're well that there is an argument that um post 
high school education is is losing its value in most in most arenas. However, um, if we are looking in that space, regardless, there needs to be a push by say, fashion needs to embrace tech and and actually push out this narrative or uh, further conversations in regards to hey, these are the new types of jobs that are going to appear. Whether it's regards to uh, being a three D model or designer, whether it's um, more visual content say for example like i know with the institute of digital fashion there's a wealth of roles which aren't coming from people with with an interest in fashion it's people coming from different places and that we can only depend on that if um for so long so for for we need because if we keep on going with saying like hey um this is how this person became a designer in the 90s or, or whatever it's like we're, we're teaching people about careers that won't exist in the same way in, in the next few years. So there needs to be just a general push in terms of like, hey, this is, we need to embrace the technology that's coming ahead. We need to push that message to, to schools and we need to push that to the general audience as well. So that it's not that it's the automation has left people out of jobs. It's, yeah, well, it's tip, it's actually just that the, um, the lack of information and and the growing gap is what will leave people out of jobs. So I'm not really anti-tech. It's just more that if this is passed on and shared with the general public, people in schools and all of, and people actually are upskilled. I know there's a difficulty in conversation with regards to, um, like, say there was this whole argument around this whole learn to code narrative which went on. But if we if we don't try there's there's going to be a lot more problems simply because we're more fearful of, yeah, of no. something that is a is pretty straightforward to kind of pick up and upskill or even impart onto the new generation you see how people are teaching themselves to code and all of these other things as well i mean i just can I just say just in terms of the automation thing because i don't know like if I, I was super clear or very clear about that i mean i think personally like i mean i'm sort of Politically, I'm from a sort of Marxist perspective. So actually, the the idea of uh, automation or the 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 um, is is in principle we should be striving for that because actually we as human beings shouldn't be classed as workers. We're we're greater than workers, right? Like working is a kind of um, a necessity because of the, the the mode of production that we are currently kind of in, right? But the less work we have to do, the better. I From, love that. Um, <laughs> so you know, and, and and if and if technologies allows us to do that um, and live a more fruitful life, um, then all the better, right? But I think that the 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 issue is more to is to do with like what is um, if say for instance automation um, an an an, uh, an intensification of automation to to such a scale where for instance predictions are potentially like fifty percent of existing kind of jobs will be automated to some degree like what are we going to do with that that time that extra time and like how are we going to sustain a kind of um a dignified life and i think that is the kind for me that is the um that is one of the crucial questions that we need to sort of collectively whatever kind of um come to terms with and i think there's masses of um the spectrum for what the possibilities are are, are kind of is, is great but i mean but it also includes, I mean, horrendousness, but it could also mean that we have so much more time to concentrate on articulating ourselves and expressing ourselves and and um, being creative in whatever ways we, we choose to. Um, which, which some oh, of these- that, Sorry, I'd love to re just respond to, uh, to get yeah. my thoughts out. Sorry, thank you. So with the, uh, with the coin that you put forward in terms of, um, most of these jobs are going into automation or are going to be automated in the near future. The other side of that coin is there's going to be a massive skills gap and uh, millions of jobs evade which don't go filled simply because they need the skilled people to actually work on the systems that are becoming automated at this point. Because mm. as we know with say, uh, any of the technology we're using at this moment there isn't it's not it's not perfect and it won't be perfect anytime soon it's literally updating and, and creating a typical response like you don't speak to most programmers it's not that they know 
things off memory. It's simple, simply that, hey, I'm batching together code and I'm gonna go and search on Google for how does how to fix this in Python or how to switch mm. this into or or make this up applicable to say any other language. It's it's not that we're hyper proficient. And then of course with leaving things simply to technology is, is also that rising fear of um our AI or our computer overlords kind of taking over. But anyway, sorry. Um the there is a massive um yeah just essentially wanted to say there will be a mass because there is already a massive shortage of jobs with regards to people who are programmers and coders and, and various other things that will be needed for this uh upcoming technological revolution but it's yeah so that's that's just um my thoughts on that i just wanted to not like to to bite back but to just add on to the other side of that coin God, I think we should organize a new, another panel as well just to discuss on the kind of future of um, of automation and AI because it's such an interesting topic and so many times when you talk about um, technology and its uses this comes up the fit the balanceable fear to the the utopian future and how they kind of intercept one another and it's really interesting to think that that we're we're talking about fashion but we've come down to the kind of I suppose the the existence of of us humans in that new landscape and where our roles are and what that I think it but I think it also sort of yeah. it does also touch on things like mm -hmm. um in a way it's like the question of the, the what what will it be like in 2030 I mean yeah. in a way for me it's like also sort of like just question of like well like in a way ideally like what we understand as fashion as a as anything either yeah. as a kind of discipline or an industry or whatever will just be I mean in the best possible way will be completely different you know, I mean, just will be like it yeah. be, because the um, the conditions that people are, are in, which allow themselves to um, have the time and the space to be able to um, uh, uh, um, kind of articulate themselves and, and be kind of creative and kind of be as um, fulfilled as kind of humans can be, then then the role of fashion in that type of situation will be super different to what it's like now, which is, you know, I mean, it, like fashion as we understand it now is is a kind of um, is a kind of byproduct of, of capitalism, right? Yeah. Um, and so, so the the way that we use fashion is is um, is, is a kind of result of that. But yeah, you know, in a in a, in a future yeah. period where maybe things are very very sort of different, then. The, how we use fashion and its purpose so, sociologically is just very would be potentially very different and I think there's amazing opportunities for that you know? yeah absolutely. Um, but I don't think it would necessarily be like the the kind of dawning or kind of the wearing of of, of garments in a way I think like that's the least interesting thing of the of the possibilities right I mean, it's like, it's just yeah. so boring if that's the case. I'm sort of like, <laughs> yeah, you know, if that was the case in like 2030, it's like, oh, fucking hell, like just get the it white over done with. white t-shirt reimagined. Back to the logo. Back to the logo. Yeah. Back to the logo. Yeah. It's a spinning AR, like, ooh. You know, and it, it's super interesting to think about that. Like, what is the verse of fashion and what are the kind of, yeah, the, the, like, the semantics of it in, in that space when like perhaps like the idea of physical assets are have less less worth or fulfill or don't fulfill any more the fantasies in which we're or or the kind of prestige of wearing an item that has the societal um nod of um mm -hmm. that that it means something it's impregnated with something instead yeah, yeah, of yeah. Sends it to something else oh god i think i need a cup of tea now with some whiskey in it <laughs> I'm literally going to have the wildest dreams. I feel like I'm going to write a thousand page. Um, I feel like I, this is really, I feel like that now this is a really exciting point to do another panel. <laughs> that that <laughs> was yeah. just the so, rehearsal. Sorry right? about our first hour. Now we're doing <laughs> oh, it. Yeah. Really, I love it. Now it feels like we're kind of, yeah, I think we should all, got the it, all put the Zoom down. So we're, we're a group of, we're every five. We just, yeah, we can all just <laughs> all meet up and, and just continue this. God. Well, I think this um, we should draw to a close. Um, does anyone have any closing statements, or um, should we all just meet up and chat about? It? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, 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 
Yeah, yeah, it's all good. So thank you so much, Show Studios, for having us. And um, we'll, we'll wait until we embark on the next uh, one. Uh, <laughs> so please do go and see the um, on the fifth floor of, of Harrods, um, us, us, us guys chatting. Um, and if you are watching on Show Studios, which I hope you are, do click and subscribe. Um, thank you so much. That was that was really wonderful. I feel really excited, but also scared of the future. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, it's it's going to be jolly, everyone. It's going to be silly. <laughs> <laughs> sure about that. Sure about that. <laughs>